Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is titled Sex Trafficking in Schools and it is presented by Jenny Thompson from the Poly Class Foundation. This webinar is produced by the California Child Abduction Task Force, a project of the Center for Innovation and Resources. The mission of the California Child Abduction Task Force is to reduce the risk and incidence of child abduction and to increase the effectiveness of a multidisciplinary response by enhancing skills, knowledge, and awareness of child abduction. Funding for this project comes from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. For more resources, please visit www.childabductions.org. For those of you who can hear me, this might seem obvious, but I just want to remind everyone to turn on their speakers in order to hear the presentation. Please note that there are two features to ask questions. Use the Q&A feature to ask the presenter any questions that you may have regarding content. We will save a few minutes at the end of the presentation for your questions. You may ask questions anonymously by checking the anonymous box on the Q&A feature. The chat panel is where you can ask tech support questions. We will answer questions immediately in the chat panel. If you would like to utilize closed captioning in this webinar, please click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. So now I would like to introduce our presenter, Jenny Thompson. Jenny Thompson is the Director of Legislation and Education for the Poly Class Foundation. She started her career in the missing child field after working with Petaluma's County to help find Polly. She joined the PKF shortly after Polly's recovery, volunteering on the hotline, and was eventually hired on as the hotline director. After Jenny helped PF, PKF, play a vital role in writing and passing the Amber Alert legislation both in California and in Congress, Jenny went on to work for the National Amber Alert T and TA program. She followed that by joining the FBI as an intelligence, anal intelligence analyst working on the Child Exploitation Task Force for the Washington DC field office. Jenny returned to the PKF in 2015 and calls that home. So I'm going to hand the controls over to you, Jenny. And I just want to let everybody know that we are um, going to send out the PowerPoint after, so you can expect that in an email along with a um, document from Jenny and Poly Class Foundation. So you can go ahead and share your screen, Jenny. Okay. Can you all see it okay? Um, not quite, it's not up yet. Oh, it shows for me that it's showing. Um, there we go. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you, sorry for the, for the complications right away this morning. <laughs> I'm just learning how to do these webinars too, but uh, first I would really like to thank CIR and the California Child Abduction Task Force for the opportunity to talk with all of you today. And seriously, thank you to all of you who registered have joined us. Um, I know that with COVID-19 shutting down our schools this year, and with the uncertainty of schools opening back up in the fall, that this topic may not seem relevant, but from what we know from some of our service providers, crimes against children are increasing during this time. And so our biggest concern right now is that our students who are not under the watchful eye of our school administrators and personnel are instead spending more time online and thus being targeted now more than ever. Um, I'd like to start today by telling you a story about this young woman who was trafficked during her senior year of high school. Courtney had a great childhood with loving parents and good relationships. She attended church regularly and was a varsity athlete. By the time she reached 17 though, and was a junior in high school, several painful events happened, including being assaulted after a school dance. She was struggling to cope and she was trying to medicate herself, was exposing herself to smoking and excessive drinking. And as we all know, this made Courtney vulnerable and a prime target for fellow students who were acting as spotters for a trafficker and ended up befriending her. 
Courtney started being groomed through Instagram direct messages and Snapchat private messaging, as well as in person. And just with all of our students today, Courtney had grown up with this technology, so she didn't think that establishing this kind of trustworthy relationship through a screen was odd. Um, and after close to a year, Courtney was introduced to a friend of a friend, which lent credibility to this new relationship. She grew to trust this person who became her first trafficker to the point that she allowed him to pick her up at night and she also began sneaking off school campus with him. When her parents confiscated her phone in attempts to cut communication, her friends would simply give her a new one at school the next day. Now, Courtney was only a few months shy of turning 18 at this time, and her groomers knew that it'd be easier to wait until she was a legal adult before luring her from her home to hinder both her family and law enforcement in their efforts to find her. Courtney did end up telling a family friend what was happening, and they told Courtney's parents but unfortunately by then, Courtney had already been conditioned to resist any parental intervention at all. And her parents did try to intervene by withdrawing her from school and sent her out of state. Um, but when they brought her back to her hometown, within 24 hours, contact was reestablished with these friends. Um, she left her home just days after turning 18. Courtney did get online on social media occasionally and she would tell her parents that she was safe. But her mom found out later that her messages were actually scripted by her traffickers. Um, and so for the next several years, Courtney was trafficked. And she was so brainwashed that she believed she was doing this for the greater good of her surrogate family. Um, and as we go through today's presentation, I would like for you to think about the Courtney's in your schools, in your communities, in your jurisdictions. Um, you know, Courtney's story doesn't end here, and the students in your communities, their stories don't end here either. Um, we will circle back to Courtney's story, um, but I think that it's important that we remember while talking about kids being lured, or kids who have thought to run away of their own accord, that they are first and foremost students in our school systems. So whether or not they are lured away from home or taken directly from school grounds, everyone in the school system is affected, either by truancy, from dealing with the aftermath of trauma, or dealing with questions and concerns from other students. And so we must also remember that some of these kids that are being trafficked are sitting in their classrooms and either don't know they are victims or they feel like they can't ask for help. Um, but we're the ones that can change that. And my goal today is to give you some insight into how and why these kids are lured so that we can make those changes. Um, I would like to give you a short introduction um, to the Poly Class Foundation before we dive in further so you know why it is that we are here talking about this issue of sex trafficking in schools. Um, I'm sure many of you, because we're in California, are very familiar with Polly's, Polly's story, but what came from her story after her abduction 26 years ago was that we had families calling us, asking us to do for their kids what had been done for Polly. Um, because essentially there were families all over the country that had missing kids, but they didn't know what to do to help bring them home. Um, and so everybody who was volunteering at that time just said, absolutely, that's what we want to do. Um, and so we've been doing that ever since then. Um, and we do have three focus areas. Our biggest and what makes us who we are is our response to missing children. We've helped over 10,000 families and law enforcement agencies recover missing kids at a rate of about 97% every year. Um, we worked on our first identifiable trafficking case in 2012, and have experienced the same thing that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has, in that about one in six to one in seven of the runaway cases we work, depending on the year, are likely victims of sex trafficking. And runaways take up about 85% of our caseloads, so that section of kids that are being trafficked trafficked is actually a pretty big caseload for us. Um, and so we've learned a lot over the years of we, as we've dealt with these cases about some of the vulnerabilities and some of the indicators that these kids are, are you know, going to could potentially be victims or are victims of sex trafficking. And so this has become really a passion area for us um, in helping find these kids and get them home safely before their victimization is too um, is so great that they, you know, that it takes them a lot longer to recover from this situation. Um, our second area of focus at the foundation is state and national legislation 
we advocate for policies that protect children and assist in the recovery of missing children. Um, and our third is essentially trainings like this one um, and trainings for middle school students. Uh, we go into schools and we talk about staying safe online and in the real world. Um, we talk about social media, we talk about sexting, sextortion, the sex trafficking of minors, and the dangers of running away. Um, and our goal really is to ensure that these kids are able to recognize dangerous situations and that they have the tools necessary to make good choices so they don't become victims like some of the ones we're going to discuss today. Um, and just so you know, in all of the cases I'm going to talk about today to illustrate what's happening with our students, they are all based solely on publicly available information. You know, some of these cases have not yet been tried. And because we have strict confidentiality policies at the foundation, we don't share any information that we might have in our case files. Um, and so that's an important note for you guys to know as, as we're looking at some of these cases today. Um, and I think that as we look at sex trafficking in schools, we really do need to understand how many children are in our school system in California to understand what kind of risks we're looking at for our kids. And as you can see here, in our K through 12 system here in California, we have over 6 million students enrolled. Over 65% of those are either socioeconomically disadvantaged, homeless, migrant students, or foster youth. And all four of those categories are our kids who are at risk for being trafficked. And so that number total is over 4 million kids. And that doesn't include the kids like Courtney, who are students in our schools and end up being lured due to other vulnerabilities that they have that students are also recognizing. So the difficult situation that we do face here in California is that our campuses statewide have become so dangerous for our kids. The former superintendent of public instruction, Tom Torlickson, said last winter that predators are using public schools as a new hunting ground. Um, and he could not be more right. Um, and this issue has become a very real issue with sex trafficking of our minors. Um, the US Department of Justice issued a study called The Nature and Extent of Gang Involvement in Sex Trafficking in San Diego in April of 2016 that addressed this issue. Now, because San Diego is ranked by the FBI as one of the nation's 13 highest areas of commercial sexual exploitation of children, the researchers focused on that county. Um, this was a three-year study where they gathered data from survivors and law enforcement reporting from focus groups with staff at 20 high schools and those people that felt facilitators um, who are actually the folks that we call traffickers. Um, the interesting thing about this study is that they clearly talked about gangs, but it also has a lot of great information about recruiting and what it looks like on school campuses. Of the traffickers that they interviewed in county jails, 30% reported that they have participated in or witnessed sex trafficking connected to middle schools and high schools. And at 18 of the 20 schools included in the study, staff reported documented cases of sex trafficking victimization and identified 17 recruiters that were targeting their campuses. Um, the data suggests here that teenagers are being recruited to be traffickers and to be trafficked at rates that are previously unseen. Um, and what I find amazing about this report is that they concluded that the reality that seems to be emerging is that our children and young adults are trafficking our children and young adults. Um, and this study ultimately estimated that the average age of entry for sex trafficking in San Diego is 16.1 years of age. But it's important to keep in mind that that is a very conservative number because community leaders are typically unaware of the average victim being trafficked for about three years before they reach the attention of law enforcement or social services. Um, and as we look through all of this, and, and as I read about what the staff was saying, um, one of the things that they said about the issues with gangs is that they were swooping in on newcomers, and that was the quote from them. They said the boys start talking about this at 13 years old, that they brag about helping the girls as opposed to victimizing them. And the staff cited the same risk factors that all of us have been learning over the years about these kids and what makes them 
susceptible to trafficking. And the risk factors they cited are kids being lonely, kids who are isolated and without hope for the future, kids who are in poverty, newcomers to school, prior sexual abuse, our runaways or homeless youth, undocumented persons fearing de deportation, and kids who are LGBTQ. Um, and like I said, those are all of the risk factors that we've been watching over the years, and I'm sure you all have seen too, that these are the things that make our kids really susceptible to this issue. And so if we look at this in the context of how our kids are being lured on campus, this is one that we have statistical data for. And yet it is the same anecdotal information that we have from working this crime. So what it boils down to is that our vulnerable kids who are being offered love and friendship, family, money, or material things by other students or young adults may suddenly find themselves victims of sex trafficking. This case here is an example of gangs using a woman to lure away, a uh, excuse me, to lure a runaway into a trafficking situation. This young runaway considered this woman a second mom because she bought her food and clothing. Um, but she later introduced her to these other two who took suggestive pictures of her to post on websites. They later took her to a motel. They gave her drugs and had sex with her. They then told the girl that she owed them for the drugs and put her out on a local track to earn that money. In these situations, you know, the gangs may have more resources. But as we look at this case, this man was able to manipulate a high school student to recruit other high school students to have sex with men in his house and in his van. There were four victims whose ages were 15, 16, and 17 years old. Um, and as you can see here, that high school boy was given $20 for every $100 that the girls earned for this man. Um, this trafficker and another individual would provide alcohol and drugs to these girls. Um, at first, they acted like a friend, and they were just giving him a place to hang out when they had troubles at home. But eventually, he would take explicit photos of the teens, and he used them to market them to various, mil various men willing to pay for sex. Um, he would tell the girls that they had no choice but to have sex with these men. And if we think back to Courtney, using this boy to recruit these girls for him, what, this is exactly what happened to her as well. Um, and in her case, they called the recruiter spotters. And although in this situation, they didn't give this boy that title, it's essentially what he was. Um, you know, one of the things, the other things that the school staff said in the DOJ study was that they were particularly concerned about the power of female recruiters and traffickers operating on school campuses, which is exactly what happened in this case. The 16-year-old who was lured into trafficking had told her cheerleading teammates that she was looking for a way to make money. A senior on the team sent her a Facebook message later that night asking her for her phone number. She then texted her and asked if she'd be willing to have sex for money. The teen said to her that she'd be willing to have oral sex for money, but not sex. Um, the senior then told her to send some photos of herself that were not too nasty, but kind of cute. And that is a quote from her. Um, and so once she had those, she then posted them online with her cell phone number. And two days in a row, those girls left school and went to places where men were willing to pay for sex with the teen. And the victim ended up being required to give the money to her teammate, unsurprisingly, who kept it all. Um, on the second day, the senior told her that she hadn't driven this teenager that far to only have oral sex, and that she'd have to have sex eventually, but when she refused anything but oral, the John that they had met up with got angry and sent her away. Um, fortunately for this young lady, her mom noticed changes in her behavior. And after hearing that she'd had an unexcused absence, she checked her daughter's cell phone and saw the text messages between the two and called the police, which is what ended this trafficking situation. Um, but the publication Human Trafficking in America's Schools List developmental delay as a risk factor also associated with sex trafficking. So while we're looking at vulnerabilities our young people have, she was a prime target for this kind of manipulation. And this senior took full advantage of that. Now this one to me feels a little bit scarier. These two kids were students at the same school. And so some of the red flags that we normally can see going on when somebody's being lured, we're not necessarily there. 
But what ended up happening was this 17 year old student took his 15 year old classmate to his trailer and he ended up holding her captive for three days. He gave her alcohol, marijuana and prescription pills. He kept her high and forced her to have sex with men who came by in exchange for money and narcotics. The police believed that he may have had other victims as well because he was known to be trying to recruit girls from other high schools as well as the local junior high school. So as we can see from all of these cases, just as the anecdotal information we have about our students who are being lured, whether by adults, other students, or gangs, we can see that it boils down 100% to vulnerabilities and trickery. You know, I talk with students all the time about the tricks traffickers use because they're always focused on the same things. You know, the trafficker wants to know what the student's vulnerabilities are, and how they can make that student believe that they're taking care of them. Now, according to Thorn, who most of you are probably familiar with, it's a nonprofit focused on preventing child sex trafficking. They say that more than 70% of sex trafficking happens online. Um, and in July of 2018, Polaris put out a report entitled On Ramps, Intersections, and Exit Routes, a rope for systems and industries to prevent and disrupt human trafficking. This report does tackle the same issue of recruitment and trafficking that happens online. And as I talk through this report, though, please keep in mind that um, they do say that this should not be taken um, as uh, anything but a limited sample of actual vic victim and trafficking data, as opposed to a representation of all existent victims or cases. But what I really like about this study is that what they are reporting is really important to understand where social media plays a role in luring our kids away from home. Um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline has recorded recruitment in all types of both sex and labor trafficking on mainstream and social media forms, including Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Kick, Meet Me, WhatsApp, and the dating sites like Plenty of Fish, Tinder, and Grindr. Um, victims who have called the hotline have also been tricked into trafficking through job advertisements on commercial websites like Craigslist. You know, and what's really interesting about this situation is that, you know, we often are worried about and parents are wondering what the apps are that they're not familiar with, but most of these kids are being lured on social media that we are all familiar with. Um, you know, we're all familiar with most of the um, dating apps and we're all familiar with Facegram and it's, I'm sorry, Facebook, not Facegram, Instagram, Snapchat, and Kick. Like these are all of our normal um, methods that our kids are using to talk to other people. Um, so I think that's an important thing to look at as well that, you know, we're not, they're not doing necessarily some secret hiding thing. They're right there out in the open. Um, many of Polaris's cases though did confirm that our traffickers had no qualms about using their own personal and social, uh, personal social media uh, profiles. Um, they often begin by commenting on photos, sending direct messages, building rapport and intimacy needed um, to entice victims into a false sense of trust. And as we know, the next phase is often when they become the victim's boyfriend um, and manipulation such as feed romantic interests, extreme flattery, promises of gifts or other financial assistance, providing assurance that they, and often they alone, can provide for the victim. Um, so as we look at some of these cases where kids are lured on social media, we will see examples of what Polaris has reported here. We won't always know when these kids are lured on social media um, how the trafficker convinced the youth to meet up with them, but they usually follow the same general patterns that this report was saying initially. Um, so in this case, a 15-year-old high school student was lonely. Um, her home life was abusive and she was troubled. When she met someone online who seemed to care about her, she started sharing her secrets with him. He promised he'd take care of her. He bought her a Chanel purse. He spent hundreds of dollars on meals for her and he treated her to manicures and pedicures. He made her feel pretty and wanted. And eventually she left home and moved in with this man. And soon he moved them out of the area where she had been raised. And it was then that he began asking for favors at which point the trafficking began. 
Jenny, sorry, can I interrupt you really quickly? Um, it's sure. Amy. Um, I think we're having a little muffle with your mic or your earbuds. If, if you just want to readjust where you're speaking is coming from. Okay. Is that better? Um, will you just keep? How about that? Are we doing better there? Yes, that's better. Thank you. Okay. I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry <laughs> that's about okay. That, Okay, so this is another one of those cases that the Polaris report was. Sorry, referring it's to. it's still a little muffled. I'm not I'm sure. Not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what to do. Because I know if I turn on my computer speaker, we get a reverb. That's actually better. That's better. Oh, okay, good. Yes, there we go. Okay, try not to touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to throw you off. There we go. No, okay. It's totally fine. Um, so uh, again, as we look at one of these, it, I'm sorry, this is, <laughs> I'll get myself back on track. So this is another one of those cases that Polaris report was referring to um, where a trafficker will spend time building the report, I'm sorry, the report and intimacy needed to entice victims into a false sense of trust. Um, this 16 year old was the computer programmer for her school's robotics team. Her parents saw her on her computer all the time, but they never guessed that she was communicating with anyone she didn't know. When she left home to meet up with her eventual trafficker, law enforcement discovered that she was in contact with multiple men that were grooming her and did find explicit tech chats between these two. Um, five days later, when this young lady was found, um, this gentleman was taken into custody and faced felony charges, including human trafficking, child pornography, and endangering the welfare of a minor. Now, according to the Polaris report, there is also a slightly different version of the grooming process that is accelerated where geography is factored in before an online relationship exists. And so with so many location-based apps and so many different people using them to seek out potential romantic partners, it also allows for vulnerable youth to seek out the same kind of relationships or to seek out someone with the means to provide them with what they need to survive. And in those cases, sex trafficking can become personal sexual servitude if the exploiter begins to provide the minor with money, drugs, transportation, shelter, food, gifts, you know, et cetera. Like there's so many things that they're trying to, to give these kids so that they can get something in return. And this is exactly what happened to a 15 year old in this case who was a runaway from home. When she was found, she told police that she had met with several men and that she had had sex with them, including this junior high school social studies teacher. She had met him and many other men um, through Kick, and she had also exchanged nude photos with this man through Kick as well. Polaris's report said um, that the ability to target a slightly desirable, uh, I'm sorry, a different desirable audience um, also makes social media an ideal venue for deceptive or fraudulent job ads to a vulnerable population. And um, sometimes these jobs are for offers of modeling or dancing, which continue to blow me away because it's the same tricks that traffickers have used for decades um, or online predators or just predators in general. Um, but sometimes on social media, these are done through fake advertisements or fake business profiles, even fake event pages. Um, but sometimes traffickers contact potential victims directly. And the latter is what happened to the two young ladies who were 12 and 13 years old in this case. They were best friends who lived in Kentucky and were in a chat room together when they met a man who told them that they were beautiful, that he owned a modeling agency out here in California, and that he wanted to sign them to his company. He said he'd send them bus tickets if they would come out to California. But the catch was they couldn't tell anyone. They followed his directions. They packed up their things and they got on a bus to California. And they were here for one night before they were recovered um, and were ultimately trafficked by this man who clearly to us didn't own a modeling agency. The problem is that our kids can't see what we can. They don't have the life experience yet. So can you imagine being from Kentucky dreaming about what California is like, and then having someone build up your self-esteem that way. Um, but one of the things that I talk with kids about in schools all the time is that if you have to lie or run away from home for something, it's not a legitimate offer. 
Um, and I also tell them that if their online boyfriend or girlfriend isn't willing to meet your family or friends, they're also not a legitimate relationship. Um, and so we really can use any of these cases or the others that you've worked to help our kids see the red flags and keep themselves safe at home. So when these kids do run, and I'm putting that in quotes, um, when they're being lured, we tend to assume that these kids are just runaways. Um, after all, we are talking about 15 to 17 year olds, with the only exception in the cases I've talked about today with our 12 and 13 year old Kentucky girls. But this is where we can make real change. When we do label a child a runaway, we often miss their victimization. So if we start thinking about these kids as not just runaways and start investigating these cases to look for indicators that these kids are potentially victims who have been lured online or in person, we have the potential to stop the victimization of these kids. Now this does take some effort. It requires a more thorough report, especially for our repeat runaways. You know, we can't write repeat ways on these reports anymore. Um, I've seen those from around the country um, and it just isn't gonna solve, serve our purpose to help stop this victimization. We have to ask more questions of families, especially for our repeat runaways. Um, we need to ask things like where he or she was found last time. We need to ask about new friends or new belongings. We need to ask about recent behavior changes any changes at school with grades or with other students. We have to ask more upfront than we typically do. Now, I do wanna tell you that I mentioned that I, excuse me, that I understand that there are two problems for law enforcement investigating these cases. Number one, you have too many to possibly follow up on them all. I wish you could, but I understand wholeheartedly that you have too many. Um, and I also understand that these kids really do appear to leave willingly. And so it's hard to label them anything other than a runaway or a repeat runaway. But that's why I'm suggesting that you look for the indicators that these kids are potentially being trafficked. If they are there, your case should go to the top of your pile. If you know they're your typical, I had a fight with mom or dad runaways, and you know they'll be home in two days, then deal with those according to your policy. But please check the indicators or maybe especially check the indicators for those that are repeat runaways. What we've learned over the years is that our repeat runaways are often our repeat victims. Um, the National Center for Missing Exploited Children um, wrote an article called, What If You're Right? And in that article, they say that these kids don't always look like children because their youth is often hiding under layers of makeup, provocative clothing, and attitudes. They also cite that the average age of a traffic child, uh, excuse me, yeah, is a traffic who is reported to them is 15 years old. Um, and this is the same time frame in a young person's life that we have assumed for years or maybe decades means that they should automatically be labeled a runaway if there's no sign of foul play. And I'd really like to challenge that thinking today. It really is the only way that we will be able to get these kids home before they are under someone's control the way that Courtney was. Um, I have given a list of these indicators to the CIR team for them to distribute. You can use them to help prompt the questions that need to be answered, so you can tell if this is a top of the pile case or not. Um, and as I'll, I'll share a little bit later with you about the things that the Poly Class Foundation can do to help you, this is also one of those things that we can do is we can talk to you about when, what some of these indicators are and, and uh, you know, and, and see if they are a situation where your case should go to the top of your top of your pile. Um, but as I mentioned, as I started this presentation, many of our child victims of sex trafficking are students in our schools, um, and sometimes they are our runaway or repeat runaway kids, which we know absolutely impacts their ability to learn because they are missing so much school. But even those whose whereabouts are generally known can't pay attention in school. They have trouble attending regularly and feel like they can't relate to anything going on around them in school or with their peers. I mean, can you imagine being taken either at night or on the weekends and being forced to have sex with strangers and then going to school and trying to focus on math? It just is impossible for these kids. 
and trauma is one of the big reasons why. Um, you know, and one of the ways that trafficking will create an impact on the learning environment is really through behavioral issues. Um, this quote that says, I didn't care about school at all. In fact, I was so uncomfortable there, so afraid that people were talking about me and telling others about what I was doing. I was constantly getting into fights. This gave me a way to keep people scared of me and to get myself a suspension so that I could leave school. And so if we're talking about behavior, what this young person who was still being victimized was dealing with was social anxiety, oppositional behavior, hyper reactivity, and trust issues. And this is our student that gets labeled the bad or the difficult or a nuisance child. But the real problem is that he or she is being traumatized over and over and over again. And in this case, the trauma is leading to aggression and truancy, which have a huge impact on his or her ability to learn as well. The same is true with this student um, who says, I had a feeling that my teacher knew something was wrong in my life. I would notice her looking at me, almost like she wanted to say something to me. I wanted to open up to her, but I was afraid she wouldn't, excuse me, that she would judge me, and I was afraid she wouldn't understand. So one of the issues that we see regularly with trauma is that there are some massive trust issues, as I've mentioned previously. And these students that are dealing with trust issues because of trauma in their lives are going to be too scared to learn. They don't trust their environment. They don't trust their teachers. They don't trust their peers. Um, and they're often living under many threats. Um, and so they have a hard time forming and maintaining healthy relationships in the school setting. Um, you know, and this is the kid that gets labeled a loner or shy or stuck up because they don't seek anyone out because he or she doesn't believe that they have a support system at all. You know, the truth is his or her trafficker has inevitably told them not to tell. Don't talk about it. Don't say anything to anybody you know, um, or else. And then whatever threat that you wanna throw in there that has completely terrified these kids um, as they're sitting in school. Um, you know, and I, I showed you the numbers earlier about what was happening in California with our, you know, 4 million students who fit within the four risk categories of the, of the Department of Education. Um, and so, you know, one of these things is the issue of truancy. Um, and this is where we see some of the big impact. You know, being chronically absent or chronically truant means that a student has missed more than 10% of the school year. And this is one of the big indicators that could potentially tell us a lot when we're looking to help our kids in the school system. So when you're investigating a case, take a look at school records, talk with the student's teachers or administrators or even the school nurse and look at their truancy numbers because it might tell you a lot about what's happening with your missing child or with your potential trafficking victim. Um, and since we're talking about helping our kids that are in school systems, we do come to this. Um, California passed AB 1227, the Human Trafficking Prevention Education Training Act in 2017. And since that time, two other bills have passed that added more information to this law that is now part of the California Healthy Youth Act. And the bottom line is that the California Healthy Youth Act is essentially sex ed with a significant number of topics covered. Um, and what AB 1227 did was add a mandate that schools provide information on human trafficking at least once in junior high or in middle school and at least once in high school. Um, the info on human trafficking has to include the prevalence, nature, and strategies to reduce the risk of human trafficking, techniques to set healthy boundaries, and how to safely ask The first is to discuss how social media and mo Hi, Jenny, sorry, you, I think you're muted. Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, I was like, I can't get back to that screen. <laughs> there you go. I'm not, I'm sorry guys, I, I don't, I thought we were gonna be able to get through this pretty easily. Um, 
But uh, anyway, the first the first bill um, adds to this that they need to discuss how social media and mobile device applications are used for human trafficking. Um, and the second bill is the one to also discuss the potential risks and consequences of creating and sharing sexually suggestive or sexually explicit material through cell phones, social networking, internet websites, computer networks, or other digital media. Um, fortunately, California has had several amazing organizations step up to provide this training to schools in their areas in varying ways. Um, I would love to give you a list of them, but I'm sure certain I would leave somebody out and I, and I don't wanna do that, but a simple Google search will show you um, who's working on these issues here. Um, but there are several different methodologies being used um, for how they're being offered. So some of them are in-person trainings, like the one that we do. Some are online and some are train the trainers. So they're teaching teachers how to teach this to their students. Um, and so different schools and different school dis districts are choosing what's best for them. Um, but no matter what training a school uses, we truly believe that if we can educate these kids about how to protect themselves from traffickers and other sexual predators, we can help keep them from be becoming victims of this crime. So let me circle back to Courtney and tell you the end of her story. When we left off, Courtney was so brainwashed that she thought that she was doing all of this for the greater good of her surrogate family. Courtney knew that she was suffering. She knew that her life was in danger. She knew she was going against everything she had believed, <clears throat> excuse me, had believed in, but she couldn't put it together that it was her traffickers who were to blame because she loved them. She started slowing down her use of drugs and alcohol around that time and became more clear. She also began to question the people she was with and the life she was living. She returned home at the end of 2018, but things got worse before they got better. She said she surrounded herself with similar relationships and environments and eventually was arrested on felony drug charges. And she knew that was her rock bottom moment, that the only place to go up. Courtney's arrest led her to a five month stay at an inpatient program that specialized in providing care for women who have escaped sexual exploitation. Courtney has said that that trauma informed counseling was a huge key in helping her heal and understand what complex trauma does to the brain. She was able to peel back the layers of things that she hadn't yet dealt with. Um, and Courtney says now that being of service to others is what defines her rather than what happened to her. And as you can see here, Courtney is now doing big things with her life. She is absolutely a survivor and was just appointed to the US Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. And she is also the ambassador for Childproof America, which is a nonprofit her mom started in 2016 to empower families in the battle against sex trafficking. It is my sincere hope that with Courtney's story and the others that we've talked about today, that they've provided you with more information about our students' potential vulnerabilities, and that that information helps you keep your community safe. And I also hope that as we talked about indicators, that a missing child might be a trafficking victim, that you'll look through the copy of the list we provided here today and use those to determine what your next steps will be if you're investigating a case. You know, making our schools a place where students are safe from recruiters, from ongoing trafficking and from the extreme trauma that creates is really up to all of us. What I want you to know as we wrap up that the Polyclass Foundation is here to support you in all of your efforts to protect children. Um, when we're working with law enforcement, we work as a partner, a solely as a partner. We will never take on the role of investigator or do anything with, without explicit permission of the investigating officer. Um, all we want to do is help bring these kids home safe. And we have many, many tools to help you do that. Um, and one, like I said earlier, is that we can really take a look at a case at the beginning and try to help you determine if there are indicators that this, this child could potentially be a trafficking victim. But we also have ways of communicating additionally, like kind of outside our world and across the nation. Um, we do massive flyer distributions um, anytime they are necessary. Uh, we can blanket a certain area, we can blanket the whole country, 
we can pick places like you know restaurants or gas stations or truck stops so we have a lot of different options that we can help you with um, we also have international website exposure and we have e-volunteers that work through our through our website and through our social media to print and post um, flyers if need be in, in their certain areas um, and we also have a huge social media presence where we put all of our cases um, that are okayed by law enforcement up on there so that we can get the information out to as many people as possible um, and as many of you know uh, law enforcement sometimes isn't the first place that somebody wants to call if they have a lead on something um, and so we do intake leads um, through the foundation but we don't do anything with those except send them to you immediately so i really hope that as you're working on missing child cases you might think of us to be able to assist you because we really are here to help you um, if we can and everything that we do is free of charge so please don't worry about calling us or having your families call us. we would love to help in any way that we can um, so thank you all i appreciate your time and participation and again i apologize for the sound issues um, but i have left time here uh, in case there are questions or comments or anything you'd like to say so um, so i am here and available and would love to talk to some of you. Yes, so we do have um, lots of questions that have been coming in, Jenny. So I'll just start with the ones that I have already. Um, okay. And for those who would like to keep sending in questions, I would appreciate if you could send them on the Q&A feature um, of the bottom of your screen and we will get to the rest of the questions. Um, so someone is asking if you have um, knowledge of what sentences do the spotters or underage traffickers usually get? Uh, uh, honestly, I haven't heard anything about uh, sentences yet for these for these folks. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's there's got to be a charge. <laughs> I just haven't seen it come up in any of these cases yet that these kids have actually been charged for something. Um, so. Uh, you know, unfortunately, somebody else might have a better answer to that who's on this webinar. So I apologize for not knowing. But, um, you know, in everything that I've read and everything that's publicly available, I haven't I haven't re read anything about what happens with these spotters. OK, thank you. So if anybody has that information, you could put it into the chat panel for all of us to see. That would be great. Um, so I, a lot of people are asking for more resources. So I know on PolyClass, you have tons of resources there. Um, so if you have any other information or direction for resources that you'd like to give or just kind of direct people to the PolyClass website, which is on the screen right now. Yeah, if you want to, um, we have a lot of information about, you know, how to protect kids and we have uh, safety kits that teach how to teach Kind of these safety issues to kids at varying ages so that it's all age appropriate education and um, so please visit our website for that that is up here on the screen at polyclass.org and it's two a's and one s.org um, if you have something specific that you're looking for i would love to help you find that so if you want to send an email um, either to me personally uh, that my email is up there or to our service at polyclass we are all more than happy to help you um, find the resources that you need Awesome. And then do you have things like brochures on the website that people can print out to hand out? We do. Um, okay. And uh, and those are typically our social media safety um, things. And we also have information up there about what we teach um, to school students. So if you're interested in any of that, that's up there as well. Okay. And on that note, there were a few questions about why this knowledge um, and a presentation like yours is not being done in schools or why teachers are not required to take a class on this but i think you do this in schools correct so this is something that is yes out there. we do yes it absolutely is and because of ab 1227 the law that passed in in 2017 it is actually a mandate for schools here in california um, unfortunately you know not all of them have gotten up to speed as quickly some of the problem um, with this issue is that teachers already have so much to teach and they aren't experts in this area and so um, what we found when we go into schools is that teachers are so happy to have somebody come in and, and take this piece for them 
because they aren't the experts that can give that information to the kids. And, you know, sometimes kids listen to somebody who comes into the classroom one day better than they listen to their teachers or their parents, or, you know, we all know how that works with teenagers. So um, the organizations that are out there providing this kind of training and, you know, in the various schools around the, around the state, um, they're doing an exceptional job of helping teachers do that. So if you're looking for something in your area, um, you know, like I said, I, I did a Google search the other day and I came up with, you know, probably a half a dozen or more programs that are going on here in California. So um, there's probably something in your area. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone is asking if AB1227 applies to kids in the foster care system as well as those who are not? Absolutely, because it just applies to the school system in general. So, you know, we do know that our foster kids are also attending school, so they should be getting this information too. Okay. And then someone said that a lot, some of the approaches you mentioned um, to stop sex trafficking or to intervene allude to prevention methods like comprehensive sex education in schools. What would you say is the number one prevention method to stop sex trafficking from occurring? I really think teaching these kids what the red flags are as traffickers. You know, one of the things that I've, um, that just struck me last year as I was talking to a class is that this is just like what we used to teach kids, or we still teach young, young kids. You know, you don't get in a car with strangers. You don't have to help an adult look for their puppies, right? Like all of those things, um, you know, you don't help an adult, uh, you know, who asks for directions. That's the same kind of information we need to be teaching our, our teens about what's going on with people who are looking to harm them too. And so it really does boil down to us giving them the information they need to make good choices because we're not gonna be there and their parents aren't gonna be there when they're on these apps and they're talking to somebody they don't know. So if they understand that a trafficker is going to do everything they can to build up your self-esteem, and try to, you know, get you into a conversation where you're talking about sex constantly. It's not, you know, there's nothing else going on in your conversations. If somebody is offering you money or gifts and you haven't done anything and you don't really have that kind of relationship, those are all of the standard things that these predators have been doing forever. Um, unfortunately, they're also participating in sex trafficking. You know, we used to have, I mean, I think they probably always have been. We just understand it differently now. Um, but, you know, these used to just be the predators that were out kidnapping our kids. Um, but now they're essentially kidnapping our kids from home. So if our kids have that information, um, that's not going to happen to them. Okay, that's a great, a great uh, number one takeaway. Um, someone is also asking if you could reference um, the male population of sex trafficked victims and also the young children pop population. Um, for children under eight years old? Oh, wow. I um, don't know the answer to under eight years old. Um, what I have seen lately um, is that uh, men or boys in this situation are really starting to be talked about a whole lot more. Um, you know, there are a lot more issues around dealing with boys and sexual assault and sex trafficking, and so many of them will not self-report. And so that's part of the problem. Um, I did see a report uh, just last week, um, I wish I could remember what the title of it was, but it said that about 30% of our kids right now that are being trafficked are boys. Um, and last summer when I was at the Dallas Crimes Against Children Conference, somebody said that a study would be coming out soon that actually shows that it's a, it's a little over 50% of the time it's boys. Um, so we are really starting to understand the impact of these cases. Um, unfortunately, we're not seeing them online, so the public's not seeing them a lot, um, and it's not, you know, like, you can look up all of these titles that I gave today of these cases, and you can read the stories about them, but we don't have those for boys yet, um, and I think it's going to be really helpful when we do, because especially when we go into classrooms, we can start to get boys to understand what's happening. Um, but one of the other things we've seen, too, and one of the things that we talk about at conferences are online abductions. Um, and that's, I'm sorry, yeah, online abductions. And one of the things that we've seen is that uh, more boys are being trafficked or lured away from home from online gaming systems than from social media. 
which kind of makes sense because our girls are on social media a lot more and our boys are at home playing their games and they're playing these multiplayer games where they have private chat rooms and private parties. And so those are being infiltrated. And, and I've, I've heard and, and seen a, a number of cases where it's women who are targeting these boys but because they're at that age where they're sexually curious, you know, these women, even though they tell them who they are and what their age is and what they look like, these boys are still um, susceptible to being lured away from home. Okay, so we'll move on to our next question. Um, do you or Polyclass ever partner with social service agencies looking for their AWOL youth? Um, you know, we have. Uh, and. Part of the problem that we have found as an agency is that um, it is really hard for us to get uh, social services to sign um, a form that allows us to participate in the case. Um, because in order for us to put out pictures of kids and stuff, like I said, we have strict confidentiality policies. And so we have to have a release from, typically from the parent. Um, but in this case, since uh, you know DCS might be the people that are in charge of these kids, we can't seem to find anybody to sign those forms. And so sometimes we have a hard time getting in and helping in those cases. Um, but we have had opportunities where, you know, the uh, investigators, you know, still want to talk to us and get assistance from us. And there is a lot that we've learned about question asking, um, you know, and, and finding things through social media, uh, which, you know, isn't using any of the kind of undercover law enforcement stuff but it's all open source and, you know, we can help in some of those cases too, even if we can't distribute, you know, pictures somewhere. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and there's a lot of questions just to confirm the law policy that mandates schools to provide students with human trafficking information, if you would, wouldn't mind repeating that for us. Not at all. And I will put up the slide. There it is right there. Perfect. California ed code. And um, so and then, the, go, go ahead. ahead. The code itself is the one that's in brackets, but all of that other stuff is the fancy stuff to help you get there. Um, but if you Google 51934 of the ed code, you'll find it. Okay, and then the AB1227 is different if you want to just um, clarify that for our listeners. Actually, AB1227 was the bill that became this law that okay. changed this education code. Okay. I'm sorry, I should have made that more clear. That's okay. That's okay. We thank you for the confirmation. Um, someone wants to know if spotters are also considered victims. I don't know the answer to that. And I really wish I did. It's, it's kind of like the first question that we were asked because I'm not aware of any charges coming up. And, you know, because we don't talk about victims typically in the news, I'm not seeing any of that happen. Um, and we haven't heard of it in any of the cases that we've worked. Um, you know, we are dealing with issues in sex trafficking of figuring out if the female recruiters that are actually victims themselves, you know, are, um, you know, if we consider them victims or if we consider them, you know, somebody who's per perpetuating a crime. Um, and so there's been a lot of debate about that. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people are landing on the side that they are really victims. You know, like the the boy in that one case that I was telling you about was getting paid $20 for every $100 these girls made. He was convinced to do that. You know, that wasn't his idea. So my thinking, and of course, from an advocate standpoint, <laughs> my thinking is that those kids are all actually part of the part of the victimization of this because he wouldn't have become a part of that if he hadn't been lured into it. Right. And we are getting some responses here that um, so maybe people do have experience with the sentencing or the prosecution or investigation part, but some people are saying that usually the juveniles are not um, sentenced and that's why they are used as spotters, kind of just as a way for, um, you know, the people to to get away, get around the sentencing or um, prosecution aspect. Um, someone also said that they had two cases where the parents were using their own children as spotters. Um, so similar yeah. cases like that. Um, yeah. Someone wants to know if your agency assists with housing or shelter for um, trafficked victims. We do not. We are a missing child agency. And so our, you know, our efforts are to help law enforcement bring these kids back you know, to where they need to be. And then law enforcement typically is involved with helping find shelter or placement for them. Okay. Um, do you have any 
access to ethnicity breakdown of the victims that are being trafficked? I don't have that. Okay, that's an, another great question that came sorry, in. Sorry, my apologies. That is a great question. Um, a, a couple of people have been asking if you can let us know the name of the study you referenced throughout the presentation again. Um, there were a couple of them. One was, uh, here, I, I do have some notes, so let me, um, so when we were talking about um, gang involvement, the, uh, the title is The Nature and Extent of Gang Involvement in Sex Trafficking in San Diego. So it's a long name, The Nature and Extent of Gang Involvement in Sex Trafficking in San Diego. Um, and then uh, the one for social media, um, it's uh, a Polaris report um, and it's entitled On Ramps, Intersections and Exit Routes. Um, and then there's a big long second name, but if you just search for On Ramps, Intersections and Exit Routes, you, it will take you right there. Okay, I just put those in our chat um, so everyone can have access to those titles. Um, so we have a lot of questions and I, I'll just do a couple more because I know we're running out of time, um, but everybody is very, um, there's a lot more that people want to know. So um, in addition to the class that kids are getting in schools, are there periodic check-ins with kids or they do, do they get ongoing messaging to counter um, any of the trafficking that's going on? You know, um, I don't think they're getting enough of the messaging, but they are definitely getting it twice at least. Um, the law does require that they get it either in junior high or middle school, depending on you know, which one your county has, and then also once in high school. Um, so, you know, our what we found is we used to do sixth through ninth graders, and what we found is that we really, really could make more impact on the sixth through eighth graders with our presentation because we were catching them before they made any mistakes already. Um, and the ninth graders really need, um, they really need to hear this information from somebody, um, you know, that they absolutely respect because uh, they are just in a different place. And it's, it's almost, they almost have to unlearn what they've already learned on their own or have learned from their peers um, because they've been on those apps and they've been talking to people they don't know and all of that. So, um, these organizations that have you know all of these varying programs for different age groups it's real it is really important that there are separate programs for each of those groups okay um and so for our law enforcement folks in the room um they're wondering if if you have any tips or feedback on how law enforcement can assist future cases for example if they come across someone who appears to be trafficked yeah um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we know that sometimes these kids who are being trafficked are really difficult. It's like that uh, uh, what if you're right article from the National Center. Um, you know, they don't necessarily look like kids. They don't talk to you like kids, um, you know, and so uh, sometimes they're not going to want to, they're not going to want your help. But I really think that the more often we reach out to kids who are in this situation, the more likely we are to get them at some point to understand that something's wrong with their situation. I mean, so I would really say that as a law enforcement officer that you would spend time talking to those folks and telling them there are resources if you want resources, you know, giving them a business card and saying, you know, call if you need something and we'll get you into a shelter. Like those are just some really, it's just about you know, humanity with one another at that point, because it's not necessarily that you're going to know they're committing a crime, right? And our kids who are being victims are certainly not committing crimes, and we don't necessarily know who their, um, who their traffickers are. So sometimes it's just about starting a dialogue with these kids so that they feel safe um, in order to tell, you know, somebody something that, you know, that something is going on. And someone had um, given a recommendation saying that their agency had their school resource officers prevent, present similar info um, at their school assemblies. So just an idea for those of you out there, um, if your That's a school resource officers have, you know, that rapport with your student population. That's a great idea. Yes. Um, so if, if someone notices that there's a particular school and that is being targeted by traffickers, um, 
is there just a way to reach out to Polyclass to come to the school or how does your outreach connection work? Um, you know, if you reach out to us, we'd be happy to put you in touch with somebody else if we're not the ones that help there. But, um, you know, first and foremost, if you know a school is being targeted, I would definitely talk to, um, you know, the principal of that school or, you know, another a teacher at that school or something like that, because they need to be aware that that's happening in their area. Um, because sometimes they're not seeing it because they're so focused on what's going on either in the classroom or, you know, with some of these trouble kids or something like that. And so um, it really is important that the school personnel know that that's happening too. Okay. And, and so just to clarify for a few people, this is starting at as young as what? Um, is it grade school, middle school, or high school, or all, all three? For trafficking? So for the, for the um, school outreach and the presentations. Oh, school outreach. Well, the law only requires once in middle school and once in high school, um, but there are programs for younger kids as well. Um, our program is, we've changed it to sixth to eighth graders, and we are now trying to figure out a new way to offer that since we're not sure if we'll be able to be back in classrooms this year. Um, but there are absolutely programs for younger kids as well. Um, and even if you look at our website and download one of our safety kits, you'll be able to see some of the age appropriate things that we talk to kids about um, just to start them on the road to, you know, being safe and understanding, you know, what the dangers are out there. Okay, um, so I'm just going to do a couple more. We'll, we'll end at 1210. Um, so okay. we have so many great questions coming in. Um, someone wants to know if you know that there are trends um, around festivals or holidays that you see where kids are trafficked more or big sporting events. Um, if you see kind of a trend or statistic of that happening. You know, honestly, I have not. Um, we have, I mean, we do know that law enforcement agencies, when there is a big event happening in a town, like the Super Bowl or something like that, we know that law enforcement um, is there and paying attention to it and usually running um, operations in order to save kids that are potentially there. But we haven't yet seen any real studies or statistics about what's going on at those. Um, it's not necessarily that more trafficking is going on. It could be just that more trafficking has come into town at that time, right? Because what's happening is these kids don't stay in the same place. The traffickers move them from city to city, state to state, so that they stay out of, you know, the arms of law enforcement. Um, and so I think some of what's going on um, is that, you know, kids are just being brought in for those situations. And so it does look like there's more trafficking, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, a trend as far as that goes, because these kids were already being trafficked. Um, the operations that law enforcement does through those big events, though, is absolutely amazing. The amount of time and effort and work put in to help save some of these kids who are victims of trafficking is absolutely amazing. And so I do know that that is going on. Um, and that is, you know, an amazing way to deal with this, this kind of situation and hopefully rescue some kids from victimization. Okay, thank you. So if a student is suspected of being a victim or a participant of uh, sexual exploitation, but presenting as oppositional, disruptive, substance use, et cetera, what is the best way to provide support or provide treatment other than quote unquote, sending them away? Yeah, you know, some of that is gonna be conversations and establishing trust. And so if there's somebody in that school that that student trusts, uh, that would be a great person to talk to them. You know, one of the things that, you know, that has become super important and California is doing a really good job of is schools are putting in policies in place to deal with trafficking victims. And so, um, you know, if your school has a policy, you know, who is it that talks to them first? Or, you know, is there a service that you want to provide for them or a, a way that you take them out of class to talk to them? You know, there are all kinds of ways that school districts are dealing with this now. And so, it is really important that that child gets talked to though, so that you find out what's going on with them. Because we do really see that if kids are misbehaving, they are considered the troubled ones, but we do have to think about how much trauma affects these kids. And so that's when you're gonna see some of those behavioral issues. So I would really approach the kid. I mean, if this is, if this is new behavior for them and you know, things have changed for them dramatically at school, then something bigger is going on. Um, and that is a huge clue for anybody who's working in the school system, um, that something has changed for that child. Um, so on that matter, 
some people are wondering um, how this will look different with COVID and our kids not going back to school or possibly not going back to school soon, or if you've seen a decrease in mandated reports because of um, not being in classes recently and, and what that looks like because of our current um, situation. Yeah, we have seen uh, a huge decrease in child abuse reports, um, you know, and that's the problem with our kids not being in school kind of under the watchful eye of school administrators and teachers is that we aren't able to see those things and then make those reports. I mean, teachers make up a, a very big amount of reporting um, about child abuse. And so we're missing some of those things because kids are at home t usually with their abuser and source it's not being reported. Um, we are seeing, uh, I heard that the National Center is saying that the, um, the number of uh, online uh, uh, crimes that are happening to kids and whether that's, you know, somebody's being lured for trafficking or if it's child production that, or child pornography production, that all of those things are increasing, um, which makes sense. And why one of the reasons I was super excited to be able to talk about this today, because our kids are sitting in front of their screens now potentially, you know, 18, 20 plus hours a day. And we're not, we're not stepping away from that. And so they really can be talking to anybody they want to at any time of the day, and we don't see it. Um, and so there's not, there's not that watchful eye. And so I do think it's going to be very important that all of us who have these kinds of school programs and the schools that are maybe providing it themselves, that we figure out how to provide this to kids, even if they're going to school remotely because they need to know the red flags. If they don't know how to protect themselves, they're gonna find themselves in a situation where they're being victimized. Okay, thank you, Jenny. And because we still have 300 people on, um, I just am gonna go through the questions if you don't mind. Um, it's I don't totally mind at all. Okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's not a whole lot left, but I just, I don't wanna miss anybody's questions because they're so great and we still have such a big, audience out there. So thank you again for everybody who's out there. And just a reminder that we will send the slides out to you and the recording will be posted on CIR's website and there will be um, translation um, in our closed captioning to Spanish. So with that, a lot of people are asking about materials that Polyclass has in Spanish and information that you have to offer to bilingual communities that have at-risk youth. Well, one of the things we did last year was um, we made our community presentation accessible um, with Spanish uh, um, translators available um, so that we could reach the entire community. Um, unfortunately, that's not our it's not our strength um, as far as materials and things like that go. Uh, but we are working on it. We have um, found somebody who helps translate some of our materials for us. Um, and uh, and helps us, you know, distribute our flyers uh, about our school programs. So when there are community um, opportunities that, that folks that speak Spanish in our community can also come as well. Um, you know, if there's something in particular that you're looking for in Spanish, um, you know, always reach out. You know, the worst thing that can happen is we don't have the capability of doing it, but we certainly try to do as much as we possibly can to help our community in any way possible. Thank you. Um, so a couple of people have wanted to get more information about social media, um, and just asking that you mentioned the kick app, um, that was used to lure kids. If there are any other apps that come to mind that people should be aware of. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, this is happening still on Facebook, um, but our kids really aren't on Facebook like they used to be. They call it kind of the old people social media now. So they're mostly on Instagram and Snapchat, and that's where a lot of the trafficking is happening. That's where they're getting these kids and luring them from. Um, and so, you know, some of how you can protect your kids is not allow them to have location services on because that's how, you know, that's how somebody can find out where you live. Um, and so you don't want to have location services on and you want to use your, um, uh, your safety settings that don't allow people into your world that you don't actually know in the real world. And that's one of the things I talk to kids about is we know in this day and age, we're going to be talking to people we don't know online. That's just the way it is. But you don't have to share your whole world with everybody. And so use your privacy settings. Only let the people into your world that you actually know in real life. 
um, because nobody else needs to have that information. Uh, one of the things that happens over that is that some of these predators, all they're doing is looking at, you know, where are the pictures of where these kids are taking pictures at? And, you know, do you have on a school uh, sweatshirt that tells this, you know, predator exactly where you're at um, for one of the pictures or, you know, a soccer team or a basketball team or something? It just allows a predator to just show up out of nowhere. Um, and so keeping those privacy settings and and for sure turning off location services on um, on Snapchat is so important to help protect our kids. So with that being said, um, do you know, or does Polyclass do specific education to parents about sex trafficking? Um, well, we do have, uh, usually in January for Human Trafficking um, Prevention Month, we do um, at least one, if not multiple community um, presentations because we wanna get the same information out to parents so they know what we're teaching their kids but also so they have that information um, because it really is important that parents know what their kids are being taught to so they can talk to them about it. Okay, and then do you know if law enforcement is doing any sort of surveillance on social media or gaming platforms? Oh, absolutely. I'm, you know, and they have forever. When I, when I worked for the, uh, for the FBI, we were doing that back then and that was uh, 2000 and 2008 uh, or so. so um, we, you know, law enforcement's been doing that for a long, long time. Uh, they're in chat rooms and they're talking to, to folks who think that they're kids um, and they're helping, you know, save some victims from in that situation. Um, law enforcement does an amazing job with those operations. I, it, it's one of the things that um, is incredibly impressive about the effort that is being made to help save these kids. Because um, we're not going to, unfortunately, get them all. But the efforts are huge on the part of law enforcement as something that we all really appreciate. Right, right. Um, someone else is saying, in addition to Instagram and Snapchat, that, that TikTok is probably something that is also being used, another app. Um, thank you for letting us know. And then someone had just wanted to add that when we're talking about our youth males who are being trafficked, um, this person is saying that using an advocate when interviewing can make a huge difference. And they just wanted to kind of put that resource or that recommendation out there to everybody. Yeah, that's a great, thank you for saying that. Um, and then someone is wondering if there is any specific outreach or experience that you have working with the Hmong community. Um, we haven't done any specific outreach um, to, to the Hmong community or actually, you know, specific to anybody. When we do a community event, you know, everybody is invited to it. And so, you know, we haven't separated it down by specific communities. Um, you know, and most of our presentations like that are, you know, in the, in the Sonoma County area because that's where we're located. Um, but sometimes we're in other areas of the state just by happenstance or somebody's invited us there or something and, um, you know, it is our heart to have everybody open and available to come to those to come to those events. And then the last question that I have um, is just if if Poly Class works hand in hand with NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or how the agencies um, kind of coordinate, or or if they do. Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, we make sure that all of our cases that come in, that they've talked to the National Center, that they have a case open with them. Um, and the National Center uh, refers back to us as well. So if a family hasn't talked to us, they will um, contact us as well. Um, we do talk with the caseworkers there and, um, you know, if and when appropriate, because it's okay with law enforcement, you know, we might share information on cases or, you know, potential information about where a child might be. Um, you know, and we, we have, different areas of expertise um, uh, and you know in ours when I was talking about our flyer distribution that's something that um, that Nick Mc doesn't do but you know they have such a tremendous outreach um, you know on social media and just out there in the world that they can get information out there you know quickly too it's just sometimes in different ways and so really for us what we have always said is we don't care who brings these kids home we just want them home um, and so we will work with any partner out there that's interested in working with us to help find these missing kids and, and you know, make them safe, get them to a safe place. Thank you, Jenny. And, and we're glad that we were able to have you here today to share your knowledge and, and hope that we can, you know, create more of these safe, 
spaces and safe returns home for these kids. Um, we had tons of people in the chat, lots of good conversations and people in different counties um, just kind of having recommendations and outreach and resources that they have. So thank you everybody for participating. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the comments, um, but thank you everybody for being here today. And again, we will send out the PowerPoint and we also are sending out the indicator sheet that Jenny mentioned earlier. Um, and then this, will, this recording will be up on our website within a few days. Um, so thank you so much. Please feel free to reach out to myself at CIR um, or the number or email that's up on the screen to reach directly out to Jenny or Polly Class. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. everybody. Very much appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.